Good afternoon, and what a way to start the afternoon. This is an exceptionally good afternoon for the Princeton University community, as we have much to celebrate and be grateful for today. My name is Ben Chang, and I'm the Deputy Vice President for Communications here at Princeton University. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to join us in this celebration as we honor Dr. Suki Manabe. Thanks to all of you for joining in this moment, including those watching the live stream across uh, the live stream broadcast across campus and beyond these walls. I would first like to thank the Office of Communications, the entire team that helped put all of this together, along with all the content you may have been seeing today online on our homepage, Princeton.edu, as well as on social media. Our channels today include a history of climate modeling and a link to our digital home to all things related to environmental research here at Princeton. In particular, Dan Day, Becky, Mike Hotchkiss, Denise, Liz Fuller-Wright, Denise Applewhite, the entire team that has been alongside Dr. Manabe from uh, early morning today uh, and through the, uh, through the course of uh, the last few hours. A few details about this press conference. We will start with remarks by Debbie Prentice, the provost of Princeton University, Stefan Fuglestadler, Director of our Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences Program and Director of the Cooperative Institute for Modeling the Earth System, and Tom Delworth, Senior Scientist at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. Just don't be fooled by his Wisconsin Badgers face mask. Where is Tom? There he is. After that, Dr. Manabe will speak, the moment we know everyone is really waiting for. When he concludes, we will open the floor to questions from the media. We will call upon each member of the media, and a runner will bring the reporter a microphone so everyone can hear your question. So please hold your question until you receive the microphone. Beyond the media, uh, I'm happy to say uh, this is a room full of uh, students, faculty, and staff who are friends and fans of Dr. Manabe and members of his family, which, uh, whom we'd like to, to greet uh, and honor as well on this special day. Depending on the number of media questions, uh, we hope to leave some time for uh, audience questions as well. With that, I am pleased to hand the microphone over to the Provost of Princeton University, Debbie Prentice. Thank you, Ben. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this press conference and this wonderful celebration. This is a very, very special occasion uh, for Dr. Manabe uh, the Laureate and his family and his countries. Uh, in this case, both Japan and the United States can beam proudly. Uh, this is also an important moment for our community, uh, the students, faculty, and researchers and staff uh, who are proud and grateful to call Suki Manabe a colleague, partner, and friend. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Manabe. Um, he is a pioneer in his field and a pioneer for humanity. Um, he was one of the founding scientists of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, a national climate research laboratory that, that is a joint endeavor of Princeton University and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Dr. Manabe created the first global climate model after his groundbreaking studies of atmospheric dynamics in the 1960s. Um, but let's go back to the beginning. So born in 1931 in Ehime Prefecture, Japan, Dr. Manabe received his PhD from the University of Tokyo in 1958. That same year, he came from Japan uh, to the United States to join NOAA's predecessor organization, the National Weather Service, where he used physics to model weather systems. In 1963, Dr. Manabe moved from Washington, D.C. to Princeton to help lead GFDL, and in 1968, he became a member of Princeton University's faculty. Dr. Manabe was co-author of a 1967 paper that was the first credible report of climate change and led to the creation of the first three-dimensional model of global warming in 1975. Dr. Manabe identified profound connections between the sea, the land, and the atmosphere. His revolutionary idea, using numerical modeling to predict how the Earth's surface temperatures are influenced by atmospheric conditions, 
was a major breakthrough, giving researchers a powerful new tool to investigate the Earth's complex climate systems. His work is foundational for all modern climate research, uh, as, as the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences noted in, in announcing the award today. They said his work laid the foundation for the development of current climate models. Um, and as Gabe Vecchi, uh, who is Professor of Geosciences and Director of the High Meadows Environmental Institute here at Princeton, said, the whole field of climate modeling originates with Suki. The idea that you can take something so complex as the climate system and code the equations that govern it and put them in a computer and use that to simulate the climate system started with him. A and doing so not only illustrated some of the potential consequences of global warming, but gave us a roadmap of how to do climate science. Dr. Manabe exemplifies this university's commitment to addressing the world's most pressing challenges, climate change chief among them, through steadfast, incisive, and world-changing research in the nation's service and in the service of humanity. So we are now going to hear from a couple of Dr. Manabe's colleagues. Uh, let me ask uh, Professor Fuglestaller to say a few words. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's absolutely an immense pleasure to be here, Suki, to congratulate you for the Nobel Prize in Physics. I think everybody in this auditorium was, like me, absolutely thrilled this morning when we read the news. We usually associate the Nobel Prize in Physics with stellar music and faraway galaxies, yet here this prize is devoted to someone who devoted his life to the study of of a very home. It's no exaggeration to call Dr. Manabi a giant. In a handful of papers, some 50 years ago, he redefined climate science and laid the ground for modern climate science, a science that is quantitative and that allows predictions. Unfortunately, the world set out to test Dr. Manabe's predictions of what will happen if we continue to emit carbon dioxide. As you all know, Dr. Manabe's prediction of what will happen proved to be correct and stood the test of time. Dr. Manabe knew what he wanted to achieve and he knew how to do it. Sometimes it's that simple in hindsight. Dr. Manabe's work is outstanding also because in the first step, he dramatically idealized and simplified the problem and basically boiled it down to its very essence, namely a single atmospheric column. His work was the first to show that when done correctly, this gives us the backbone of the entire system and predict its temperature and rainfall remarkably accurate. Among his first experiments was the doubling of carbon dioxide. It was known at the time that carbon dioxide may affect climate, but this was the first reliable calculation. And most importantly, he recognized the paramount importance of the water vapor feedback, which gives you roughly double the temperature increase that you get from the carbon dioxide alone. So the problem is much worse than what you think if you only look at carbon dioxide. He then went on and placed a trail studying the system with three-dimensional climate models. Initially, just the atmosphere, then together with Kirk Bryan, he added the ocean, then ice, and in doing so, basically created the blueprint for every single climate model that is in use today. Roughly 25 years ago, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was actually awarded to Mario Molina, Sherry Rowland, and Paul Crutzen for their work on, um, regarding the ozone hole. Their work also paved the way for eventual <clears throat> political action, and the world avoided um, a UV catastrophe. Today, Dr. Manabe receives the Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking research, leading to our understanding of the enormous consequences if we continue to increase carbon dioxide. Dr. Manabe's work touches, however, not a problem related to coolants, but in fact the very essence, or basically the very reason that we are in this comfortable world that we all got used to. So the challenge to address this problem 
is orders of magnitude larger. Dr. Manabe's work is a wonderful example how essentially blue sky research decades ago can provide the foundation for understanding and hopefully solving existential problems. Thank you, Suki. Thank you. On behalf of GFDL Director Ramaswamy, GFDL Deputy Director Whit Anderson, all the staff at GFDL and all of Suki's colleagues across NOAA, I want to convey how delighted we are at this richly deserved award that you received today. My name is Tom Delworth, the senior scientist at NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory at GFDL, and where Suki worked for many years. I had the great pleasure and honor of having Suki as my boss for the first 13 years of my career. And that was an amazing experience to, to see him and interact with him every single day. From my perspective, Suki is one of the true founders of the field of climate science and climate modeling, a topic that is of such profound importance now to society. When, when Suki started his career in the 1950s, the topic of global warming was, was quite obscure, but his inspired vision led him to make the fundamental discoveries upon which all of modern climate science rests. His papers from the 1960s were so visionary and prescient that they are still relevant today, and I still teach them here in my class later this afternoon at Princeton, you'll see. The, what you learned from the, those papers in the 60s stands the test of time. Many of the climate predictions from the earliest models still hold on, still hold up well today. I have many images of, of Suki over the years, from his afternoon jogs around the Princeton Forest Hill campus to expounding on the wisdom of the Princeton basketball coach at the time, Pete Carrill. The reason I think he liked him was that Coach Carrill boiled down the game of basketball to its very essence, the very simplicity of basketball, and he met with amazing success. I think that was Suki's philosophy in boiling down climate science to its very essence, and of course, has met with great success. But one of the real images that sticks with me is in every seminar I would go to at GFDL, Suki was there in the front row on the right side, he was amazingly engaged with every single speaker who came through. His curiosity and his quest for understanding the climate system was insatiable. It was an amazing sight to see. He always was boiling things down, whatever the topic was, down to its essence. That insatiable curiosity, sense of wonder, all the, the ability to boil down any topic into its essence, and incredible persistence and hard work. Those are some of Suki's true characteristics that have guided him over the years. I know that I can speak for many colleagues who have benefited so much over the years from Suki's vision and enthusiasm. He's been an inspiring and enthusiastic mentor over the years. He had a great ability to help people to grow into their own independent scientists. We're all so delighted at this wonderful recognition of his pioneering and visionary career. I'd like to close with an analogy, so please hang with me. You've probably all heard of Michael Jordan, the basketball player. I've always viewed Suki as the Michael Jordan of climate. <laughs> Michael Jordan came from an outstanding university, North Carolina, great basketball players, went into the NBA and was the world's best player. Suki from a premier institution at the University of Tokyo, came to the U.S. and became the premier climate scientist in the world, one of them at least. I'd like to say that beyond what, say, Michael Jordan accomplished on his own, he elevated the entire NBA to iconic status, not just in the U.S., but around the world. So too Suki, in his presence, elevates the entire field of climate scientists to its standing today in the field of such vital and outstanding importance. So I, I view Suki as the Michael Jordan. 
So to Suki and Noko, we're all just so very happy at this incredibly richly deserved award that I was just delighted to wake up to find out this morning, and I can't think of anyone who is more deserving of this award. Congratulations, Suki. Dr. Manabe, over to you. And you can take your, your mask off if you want. Okay. Oh, I take it. Yeah. Um, as I get older, both my Japanese and English are deteriorating steadily. So please forgive me uh, uh, the, uh, my uh, broken English here. Um, it is a great First, I should say, surprise and uh, honor to be chosen by the Royal Swedish Academy of Science to receive Nobel Prize established through the generosity and far-sightedness of Mr. Nobel. On this occasion, I would like to thank Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory of NOAA and Princeton University, where I have enjoyed exploring climate change of not only industrial present, but also uh, geological past during last several centuries. I have had a really great time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Manabe. Uh, we can now turn to questions from the floor. Um, as uh, uh, reporters and others uh, get their questions in mind, and as our Mike Renner gets in place, I can kick us off with one, if that's all right, Dr. Manabe, from the Associated Press. I'm going to do my best to channel Seth Brownstein and his team, sorry, Seth Borenstein and his team from the Associated Press. Um, so I will say, you moved to Princeton from Washington, D.C., uh, something I did about three years ago, uh, though I, I'm not in the running for a Nobel Prize uh, at this stage. Uh, but, but given your experience in Washington, I was hoping to ask if you could speak for a moment about the intersection of politics and climate change and what we see as climate denialism in certain quarters. That's a very good question. Uh, to, to try to understand the climate change, or no, it's not easy, but much, much easier than what is happening in the current politics. <laughs> it's so mysterious, I can never appreciate, so that uh, try to predict or understanding climate change is difficult. But nothing is more difficult than what happens, uh, not only politics, but in society. This climate change now involves not only a, uh, the, uh, 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 our environment, but on also it involves energy, agriculture, water, and just everything you can imagine. And when these major problem of society uh, is all interwoven each other, you can understand how difficult it is to sort this thing out. Uh, and, uh, and also, we have to think about 
how to mitigate climate change is one thing, but we have to figure out how to adapt to climate change, which is happening right now, like drought, flood, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, all sort of thing. And we are faced on a very difficult problem. And so uh, some people say if we really uh, have a right prediction in climate change, it's all problem solved but it's far, far from it. So, uh, and, and, and this is, we are now facing very difficult problem. And honest, I honestly say, what is the best action we should take? Myself, I just punt this thing. Thank you. I have a feeling we could have an entire conversation about this intersection of issues <laughs> that you just noted. Uh, but we will turn to questions from the floor. And I'm looking towards uh, our colleague Mike Hoskins to call on the first. So please raise your hand if you have a question for Dr. Manabe. Yes. Hello, sir, and congratulations. Um, your co-winner, uh, Klaus Hasselmann, said while winning a Nobel Physics Prize is an honor, he would much rather have no global warming and no global prize because climate change is so dangerous. Do you feel the same way? And um, non-scientists who deny climate change often accuse scientists of being alarmists. Um, could you possibly say if you wish the models were wrong for the sake of the world but know all too well that they aren't? and tell us a bit about this conflicted feeling of knowing you are right, but wishing it wasn't so. Oh. I didn't quite understand it. Could you repeat the last half of what? final question? Well, why, don't I, why don't I take a shot at, at that just Thank for you. efficiency's sake. Yeah. The, the first question, Dr. Manabe, was you shared the 2007 Nobel Prize for Peace with the UN IPCC. Would you say that today's recognition is uh, more important to you personally or, or less? How would you compare this to the 2007 IPCC recognition? Yeah, uh, that you are talking about um, uh, IPCC Peace Prize, That's right. which uh, Al Gore and IPCC jointly uh, received. And I'm a, one of the several thousand people of IPCC uh, which uh, uh, received this prize. So um, I, I think that this is uh, uh, right. Uh, but now looking back, that's uh, IPCC, uh, uh, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Awarded uh, this award to uh, Al Gore and IPCC, you wonder why, uh, what IPCC has anything to do, climate change, anything to do with, with this uh, peace. And, uh, but now I look back and think, and you can now see. Uh, climate change, uh, the drought in the Sahel uh, creates major problem in agriculture and massive number, there are many reasons. However, one of the important reasons is that climate is make it so difficult to live over and which results in massive immigration from Africa to Europe. And so I think this is a uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize Committee has a very excellent idea to awarding this. And although I'm just one of the several thousand members of ITC, 
but that's what I think. Thank you. Uh, uh, insightful and elegant answer uh, to to uh, to yeah. the academy. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, let's uh, have another question from the floor. Um, you know, And if you would please identify yourself when you ask the question. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hank Flynn. I'm a reporter for Fox 29 in Philadelphia. A question, Professor, you and certainly the colleagues as well, the impression one gets is that this is more Nobel's acknowledgement, less of Professor's most recent academic accomplishment and more of a, a, a lifetime of accomplishment. I just like your feeling on that. He had expressed some surprise at being acknowledged by Nobel. Why, when so many of you have talked about the groundbreaking work that the man's done for decades, why is it a surprise? Why would they acknowledge him for, for his work now? Uh, could you repeat the two why question again? Uh, sure, Professor. You, you'd express some surprise that Nobel had acknowledged your work when you've been doing this, according to all of your colleagues, for decades. Why have they acknowledged your work now? Why now, do you suppose? Uh, the, uh, I, uh, uh, recently, I look at a list of uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner. And my gosh, they are almost all of them truly outstanding contribution, so far as I can understand it. It's a very uh, rigorous in their selection of these award winners. And then suddenly I think about my own work. My golly, I'm not compared with this work. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I just thought, my God, this is... Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, it's a big surprise. I got <laughs> uh, this award. That's what I feel. And, but on the other hand, now considering the uh, world crisis, which involves climate and which also involves uh, COVID vaccine, and both are the major crises in humanity. And so I thought that uh, maybe uh, I could, my contribution could be regarded as the direction to at least try to understand better what our problem is. And for that reason then I thought Maybe it's okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but uh, that's what I, my feeling of it is. I, I think many in the audience would say it's very okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question from the floor. Where's, uh, where's Mike? There's a couple down here, right? Hello, uh, my name is Yumiko Oshima from the Nikkei. Uh, I have a question about, uh, did you expect climate change would be such a serious topic and problem in the world when you started your research in 1960s? Yeah, uh, could you repeat the question right, again? I'll repeat it, I'll repeat it for you. Yeah. Did you think that climate change would be such a big problem when you started your research in the 1960s? Oh, yeah, that's an easy question to answer. And I never imagined that this uh, thing I'm, I would begin to study has such a huge consequences. And uh, I was doing it just because of my curiosity. And uh, I think many of the big discoveries which had a big impact later in, on society 
when it first started, people will never realize how, how important their contribution is. And if you think about your own research, uh, the, uh, I think most interesting research is driven from curiosity-driven research. Not research because you're doing this because it's societal importance. And uh, so, and I said that, you know, I really enjoyed uh, studying climate change. And just curiosity is a thing which drives all my research activity. And uh, uh, so I really have a great fun to use climate model as virtual laboratory of climate change. Once you make sure climate is simulating certain feature you want to study, then you do what you call uh, uh, the virtual uh, laboratory. That is, virtual climate is uh, the virtual uh, uh, laboratory of this planet, coupled ocean, atmosphere, and land surface. And it's very difficult to sort out what's going on. And the best way I did was we create, carry out many numerical experiments, changing one thing at a time, and to see what happens, just like chemistry, chemists do these laboratory experiments. And uh, the, uh, uh, I, I really recommend, and, uh, you know, it's not only modern climate, climate of a geological fast. You know, you look back and time when dinosaur was roaming around on this planet, and then come to all the way to ice age. And now we are facing major crisis, uh, which called global warming. And it is a great fun to use your model to study how climate change of the last 400 million years has evolved. And do all kinds of experiments you like. It's a great fun. So I really recommend that the, the young people use climate model, such as one uh, I had, the coupled ocean atmosphere model, but very simple parameterization, subgrid scale process, and so that it's, it doesn't cost much computer time. You carry out countless number of experiments using climate model. Have a great time. And I think that this is one thing I would like to recommend. Uh, graduate student of geoscience, and it's a great fun. And then you have a climate change of industrial present, and, geo and then you look back, Fanerozoic, all the way towards the future. Isn't that fun? Ladies and gentlemen, we have called this a press conference. I think it really is a master class in curiosity-driven research. Thank you, Dr. Manabe. Uh, but back to the press conference. Uh, there is another hand in the front row here. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Ikuko with Fuji Television of Japan. Um, my question on a side note, um, and I also would like to ask a question in Japanese if that is possible later on, but my question is 
about Nobuko-san, um, your wife, um, your wife. Um, we've heard that she has supported you a lot, a lot, and she is a very good cook. Could you tell us how she supported you um, while you were doing your research? え、uh, her cooking <laughs> every day. And sometimes she cooks Chinese food, sometimes she cooks Japanese food, and sometimes she cooks Italian food. And I'm the most blessed uh, person in terms of eating all this wonderful food she cooks. And uh, she also take care of my children very well, and I never have to worry about them. And they decide what they want to do, and then go through. I think they are also enjoying their life very much, and which is attributable to her very successful in raising children. And, and so uh, I am just able to focus on my research. And uh, I'm, uh, 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 for example, uh, actually I uh, have uh, very bad driving. And, <laughs> and suddenly if I th start thinking about something, then I'm not paying any attention to <laughs> traffic signals. And she's she's great driver, right? <laughs> and so this means I can focus my attention to my research one hundred percent. And on this occasion I would like to thank her very much for what she has done. Thank you. We were, we were able to do an instantaneous fact check and looking at the family, there were nods of the head, especially around the driving ability. So yes, that we can confirm. Thank you. And thank you to your family as well. Another question. Congratulations. My name is Gakushi Fujiwala from the Asahi Shimbun Japanese newspaper. My question is a little bit more serious. Uh, in Japan, brain drain is currently a major problem. You mentioned earlier at home the U.S. government has given you a lot of support. What are your thoughts on how to improve the environment of universities and research institutes in Japan? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so final sentence. Could you repeat again? How would you recommend improving the university and research uh, system or ecosystem in Japan? Yeah, that's a profound question. And also, I'm not much of an educator, but uh, I, I thought that um, uh, recently, uh, Japanese research uh, I, I think they are less doing less and less curiosity-driven research than before. And uh, I really hope that they would think how to improve Japanese education. Now, and I think the way uh, uh, 
scientist or something advise decision maker in Japan. This channel between scientist and policy makers, they are not communicating with each other. And uh, I think uh, U.S. is doing much better with the National Academy of Science, which is advising the government very effectively. And I think that they, they should think about more how the decision makers and the research scientists communicate with each other. That's what I think, yeah. Strengthening the connections between policymakers and research scientists it sounds like a strong uh, component uh, for, for any government, for any country. Thank you. Another question from the floor. I did see. Yes, actually, thank you, Mike. Uh, indeed, uh, if you're a member of the press or simply a member of our community, please, uh, we welcome your questions. Hi, Suki. It's yeah. hey, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, it's Suki. It's Danny Sigmund. Um, and I want to ask you what scientific question you're excited about thinking about right now. What scientific question are you thinking about right now? What's the most fun scientific question that you're thinking about right now? What is, what is the science, most interesting scientific question you are thinking about right now? R right now. Uh, yeah. Uh, in a sense, I uh, responded to that que area, the, uh, the question already, but what I think is, what I'm interested most is the paleo climate, how they evolve. And uh, after I sort of retired from research, I start looking at how uh, various living things evolve as climate change and how that living things interact back to climate change. And this interaction is so fascinating. And uh, I think that uh, that's my answer. And uh, that's what I am enjoying myself. Uh, the, uh, I start studying more than 400 million years and start uh, uh, sort of reading a book on the um, uh, past billion years or two billion years and, and begin to realize though these molecular biology which control these plankton is not easy to understand. Particularly uh, this how DNA interacts evolutions and, and so uh, uh, it, it's a very different molecular biology of the early plankton so. but without understanding them I don't think I understand it very well and it's not easy how RNA, DNA and all that can go, go back and forth and, and that just I'm having extremely difficult problem understanding it, but that's my answer. Curiosity never ends for any of us. Uh, another question from the floor. Uh, where is? Uh, uh, there, there. All right. Hi, um, Eleanor Sense with AFP. I'm in the back behind the, the cameras. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I wanted to ask you, looking back at uh, your long career and how far climate, climate science has come, what are your uh, thoughts on the enduring appeal of climate uh, skepticism and also are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of the planet? Yeah, that's uh, 
future of climate is a very interesting question. And uh, sort of uh, solar insulation, how they change as influenced by orbital parameter. And then uh, sort of, uh, uh, then you kind of extrapolate into the future because you give the solar insulation, temporal spatial variation of insulation associated with the orbital variation. And so one thing you first do is if you didn't do any of global warming, you see right now already carbon dioxide increased by uh, 45% by human race. But if we, so uh, the, my most interesting question is, if you do it, keep changing orbital parameter variation and go to future without changing in carbon dioxide. And then you put the carbon dioxide in. And then uh, you ask yourself, what happened to the continental ice? Mm -hmm. And this is the key question we have to solve right now. Because people talk about uh, 100, 200 years from now, but in after a few hundred years, uh, Greenland ice sheet faces a major danger. And uh, I think so that you can do an experiment with and without CO2 change. But the CO2 itself is affected by climate. Because climate determines how much CO2 comes from atmosphere to ocean, and ocean is a fascinating thing, storing climate for a very long period of time. And so, uh, I think this is, a, I talked about paleo climate, but I thought that this is another fascinating problem. How our climate is going to change next to 10 million years. Uh, we don't have to be 10 million years. Maybe you would like to know. So, but that involves, you have to understand dynamics and the summer dynamics of ice sheet. And the current model of ice sheet is very, very crude. And so, I think this is Probably, uh, in addition to climate change of past 100 years, but next, uh, you would like to know what is going to happen in the next million years. But again, also, it's very difficult to predict what a human is going to do. But uh, this is, a, I think, a fascinating question. Yeah. Thank you. The next question here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Genji Yamaguchi from Kyoto News Japan. Um, can you tell me what is the main reason for you to change your nationality from Japan to United States? Why did you change your nationality? The, that's an interesting question. But uh, in Japan, people always worry about not to disturb each other. You know, and they have a very harmonious relationship. And this is one of the important reasons why Japanese get, people get along so well with each other. You know, they, they keep thinking about other people and don't do something which disturb other people. And uh, the, in the U.S., so in Japan, if you ask some question, you get the answer yes or no. However, when the Japanese say yes, 
It does not necessarily mean yes. It could be no. And uh, because they don't want to hurt other people's feelings much more than anything else. And so you don't want to do anything which is disturbing to other people. Right? And U.S., I can, I can do things I want to like. And, uh, I don't worry about too much about uh, what other people feel. Because as a matter of fact, uh, I don't want to uh, hurt other people's feeling, but I'm not observing enough of other people to figure out what I, they think. Uh, and I found the US, living in the U.S. is wonderful. <laughs> and uh, probably uh, um, uh, uh, research scientists like me, I can do whatever I please in my research. My boss was generous enough to let me do anything I like to do. And he, as a matter of fact, he, he got all uh, computer expenditure. I never wrote a single research proposal in my life. So I got all the computer I want to use and do whatever I please. So that is one reason why I don't want to go back to Japan, because I'm not capable of living harmoniously. There are some feelings that I need to look out for, and those are the feelings of the folks in the top who have a question, and I don't want them to feel left out, so. Hello, uh, my name is Charlie Moulter, and I'm a first year student here at Princeton University, and I'm sitting up here with my class, which is entirely focused on climate change. So we were wondering if you had any advice for members of our generation in regard to climate change. Yeah, uh, the, I think that is the most important question in graduate school, to find out what you are good at and what you are not good at. And I recently look at a um, uh, different profession, and I found out if I do any of these professions, I'm not good at only I pro chose a profession which I, I can do, which is very few. So it's very lucky I choose. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think, again, graduate season, I recommend curiosity-driven research. And I, I think to me, that's the most important advice I would like to give, and which you are good at. It. Not because that project is attractive to other people can envy it, but, but because you choose a project, because you are good at it. And I have a difficult time finding out what I'm, I was good at. Wonderful. Thank you for the question. Appreciate that. I think we have time for one more. And let, let's make sure it's someone who hasn't already asked one, uh, perhaps down here. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Jacinta Clay. I'm one of the graduate students in the uh, Atmospheric and Ocean Sciences program, like many people here. I wanted to know, um, do you believe the work of the GFDL or climate science is benefited by a diverse and international team of researchers. She asked if the work at GFDL and in climate science more generally is benefited by having diverse people, a diverse team of people from internationally and generally diverse. What does that help? Yeah. I think the co collaboration between GFDL and Princeton is, I think, is very important. Uh, uh, 
Uh, yeah. So that, that uh, the uh, great thing they collaborate. But you know, sometimes it's not easy to collaborate, too. And so, how do we do effective collaboration? And it's important to collaborate, but easy to find out how you collaborate. And I think that is one of the questions they have to ask themselves. How they collaborate in order to be fruitful, which is not easy to do. Thank you. Um, do we have, I, I will amend my previous comment, one last burning question for the... Hi, Suki, this is uh, George Philander. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, respond to your uh, plea that we should do science for the sake of curiosity. Uh, because at the moment, we're in bad shape uh, internationally. Uh, we've lost the confidence of the layman. And uh, somebody commented how astronomers succeed in getting people interested in a black hole and all sorts of things that have little relevance to our lives. And we simply cannot get people interested in global warming. Many don't accept it. And it seems to me that one problem is we're not following your advice in doing science for fun. That whenever we talk about global warming, we paint pictures of gloom and doom, the end is in sight. Uh, it's all over. And you asked about communication between scientists and the government. And as far as I can tell, it's mostly advice uh, of, from scientists to the government and from scientists to everybody else. And it seems to me nobody likes to be told what to do. Uh, I'm from Africa, and in my opinion, the big problem in Africa is the excess of advice and the paucity of opportunities. And the way to create opportunities is to be, get people interested in the science. And so it seems to me, instead of depending on fear to instill a concern about global warming, we should have people take care of global warming because of love for the planet. And you can only love what you know. And for that purpose, everybody should be taking Danny Sigmund's course, <laughs> who tells us how the planet works, why this is the only habitable planet that we know of. Uh, I'm, I'm quite puzzled. Uh, people are interested in Mars. People even sign up to go to Mars, which is as interesting as the boring parts of Arizona. And uh, if it's a failure on the part of the scientists that we uh, cannot get the public interested in our own planet. And I think the main problem is the message of gloom and doom. And we have to change that and have to point out to them that we have the means to take care of global warming, but we need the consent of everybody. And to get that consent, everybody should have a basic knowledge <clears throat> of how the planet works. So I, I greatly admire the medical profession. Everybody knows how the human body works. Even so, we have problems with vaccinations. So we should not be surprised at this poor state of affairs in communicating climate science at the moment if we're so focused on gloom and doom and on giving advice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Manabe, I, I, I would give you the microphone if you have any last uh, comments for us before we conclude. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> the hand. A um, couple last uh, points. One is, as I would like to acknowledge, uh, of the many um, members of the Princeton University community, uh, the chair of our physics department, Dr. Anon Verlind, is here. Thank you uh, for your presence. Um, this, several other Nobel laureates. And several other Nobel laureates, whom we're uh, going to uh, toast together um, at a reception just outside after this event. So please do join us. Uh, I'm looking up to the uh, first year students as well uh, for that very special moment for our Princeton University community. 
Uh, this is not uh, product placement, uh, for those who can see the stage. Uh, it happens to be, though, a copy of Beyond Global Warming, uh, published by none other than the Princeton University Press. Um, uh, so I wanted to explain why it was uh, sitting here. Um, and lastly, thank you uh, for all of your questions and reflections. Uh, 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 I want to thank you, sir, for your comments and for your work and your lifetime of work and the support of your family who was here. Uh, we talked about surprise. We talked about curiosity-driven research. I think other, in other ways we talk about it as basic research, fundamental research, the kind of research that Princeton is built on, um, and how curiosity uh, should never end. So thank you for those words of inspiration, and congratulations again. outside for the toast. Please do come outside.